Welcome, everyone. Welcome to church. As you are making your way to the couch, as you're grabbing your coffee, I just want to take a moment to introduce you to someone very special. Over here on my right, this is Sarah Wall, and uh, she is joining our team for this awesome season uh, in Can on our Kanata campus. She's going to be our interim worship leader, while Pastor Carrie, who is over here on the keys today, uh, she is due to, uh, to have her baby any week now. And so we're excited to welcome Sarah to the team. And uh, we just want to take a moment to pray for her because we know this is not the easiest time to be jumping in. But uh, we know that everything that she needs, God will provide. So we're just going to pray for her right now. So would you just pray with me? God, we just extend our prayer, Lord, on behalf of Sarah and her family. God, we thank you that you have brought her to us, to this church, to our Kanata campus, for such a time as this, oh God. Lord, we just ask you, God, just to open up the heavens and may you anoint her with your Holy Spirit. Fill her with power. Fill her with love, Lord. And I pray as she sings and as she leads, oh God, that there would just be an invitation to come and see the goodness of our God, to taste and see all that you have done and all that you want to do. God, we believe that you are going to do great things through her leadership in this next season at Life Center, God. And so we're just saying, Lord, have your way in her life or in her family's life, Lord. Have your way in our lives and in this church. God, we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. It is such an honor and privilege to be here with the Life Center family, with the Life Center community. And even though we're spread out all across the city today, we can't be together. Uh, I want to encourage you to worship God with us. Um, wherever you are, lift your hands, lift your voice. We're going to praise God together. The psalmist says, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. And this morning, as we enter the presence of God, let's enter with thanksgiving and with praise for all he has done, for who he is, and for what he's going to do. Amen? So this morning, let's worship together. Come on.
picture that is, that his presence is an open door that we can walk through fully accepted and loved and given all the provision that God has. So as you're worshiping today, reach out and walk through that door and receive all the provision that heaven has made available to you with the greatest cost. It came with the greatest cost, the blood of Jesus Christ. And through Jesus Christ, we can enter into the very throne room of God and receive all that he has in the heavens to impart into our lives. So if you are needing faith, a fresh filling of faith today, reach out and receive that as you walk through the door of God's presence. If it is hope, if it is confidence, if it is believing for a miracle, know that God is the God of the impossible. So we step through that door of his presence. I love the, the visual of that. His presence is an open door. So we invite you today, the Holy Spirit is inviting you today to be a part of that, to walk through that door and to receive what God has prepared for you. You are loved, you are seen, and God has made a way. So Father, we open our hearts to you. We thank you that you are the God same that was yesterday, today, and forever. You are the same God, and we see your faithfulness in the past, and we thank you that you will be faithful today, and you will be faithful in the future. As so we put our hope and our trust in you, God, it's fully placed on you because you are a solid rock on whom we stand. And all other ground is shifting sand, but God, you are the solid rock and our hope is in you. So we come through that door into your presence and thank you for all that you give, all the lavish provision you have for us. And we receive that today. Thank you, God, for your abundant mercy and grace. We have a beautiful testimony to share with you today about this very thing, about walking into God's presence and walking in faith and receiving in our own journeys, every step of the way, what God has for us. There's a beautiful friend of mine named Christina who's a part of our Orleans campus and she wants to share her story with you today. And when this testimony finishes, we're gonna just declare it through the song, No Longer Slaves. So may this minister to your heart today and may you find faith in who God is. wondered what would take her so long in the washroom and came and found me. She found me flat against the wall in the bathroom with my arms stretched out in the shape of the cross, my legs straight out. She asked me, what are you doing? I said, Jesus died. We talked about why Jesus died there in the bathroom and I said to his prayer. I accepted him into my life. I went to church and attended Sunday school. I read my Bible and say my prayers. The reason I love this son, no longer slaves, so much because I left this son out in my daily life every day. I struggle with high anxiety and stress along with OCD tendencies. So this son speaks so much about not living in fear and that you are a child of God. Like no matter how much you are living in fear. I sing this song with so much passion and hope and I have a reason for that. I am a child of God, and I'm not afraid of showing that I live in fear. Well, in my case, high anxiety and stress. I completely, 100% believe what I said with this message in this moving yet powerful song. When I first found out I had Down syndrome, and I, when I was pretty young, I must admit I found it very hard, and also hard to accept. It, it took me quite a long time to accept that my Down syndrome is a part of who God made me to be. Even my parents found it hard and scary when they found out I had Down syndrome when I was born. But that didn't stop them from having me as a baby. I truly admire that of my parents with their strong faith in God and that 
didn't let living in fear stop them. So I won't let living in fear stop me because I am a child of God. This is me. I am not afraid of showing the world that too. I am brave, courageous, a warrior, compassionate, caring, loving, trustworthy, and I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. A David verse is Psalm 139.14. The reason why it's my David because it says I am fearfully and wonderfully made, which I completely believe in. I love God and He loves me. I believe that and I'm so thankful that I have a deep, intimate relationship with, with God. I hunger and thirst every day for more truth from good and powerful words from the Bible. You unravel me with a melody And you surround me with a song Of deliverance from my enemies Till all my fears are gone And I'm no longer
I am a child of God. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God.
Hebrews 4, 15 to 16 says this, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. I love this next line. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help him to help them in time of need. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we come before you and your presence is so sweet. We draw near today again to that throne of grace in the midst of struggle, in the midst of, for here in Ottawa, another set of regulations, for some of us in the midst of grief, of loss even, and heartbreak. But Lord, we hold fast to you. And like we just sang in that last song, we will not be shaken in you. Because you know, you know what's going on, you know what goes before, you know the hardships, you know the circumstance, and your promise says that you will not leave or forsake us. Instead, you extend to us a holy invitation to draw near to your throne of grace, that we get to draw near into your presence, God. Find the fullness of your presence and in you find our help and the strength we need. Oh God, we thank you. We thank you for this access. We do not take it for granted. We don't, do not take advantage of it, God, but we just extend our hearts and our hands and we say, thank you, God. Thank you that this is the reality that you invite us into. And the church said, amen. Well, amen. What a powerful time of worship. What a powerful time of worship. I would love to introduce um, myself to you. Hello. Um, my name is Pastor Sarai, and I oversee the communications here at Life Center. If you are active online, I have the privilege of seeing your comments and your messages. That's me in the chat. Um, so I just want to say a shout out to those of you who tune in week to week online and to the rest of the church who are all tuning in online at this time. And with that, I just want to say, um, we want to get to know you. So if you've been kind of like an observer, you know, you've been watching, but not really throwing those emojis in the chat during the messages, like we so encourage you to do so. If you've just been kind of watching and, and looking from the sidelines, we want to invite you in. We want to know your name. Um, we know technology isn't perfect, but we are so amazed at the ways that we've been able to connect and see relationships, see connections grow online in this time. So one way that you can do so is actually by filling out our online connect card. You can do it at connect.lifecenter.org and that is a great way for us to just know your name. If you have any prior requests, any needs, um, we would love, love to know your name and to meet you and connect online. As well, we just want to take a moment to thank God, to praise him for his provision and for his faithfulness in this season and always. And as the return of our hearts, we just want to return our first fruits to the Lord in the act of giving. So at this time or any time really, you can give online as we can't do it in person at this time, but you can give online. There are many options um, for you to choose from, whatever works for you. So you can do so at lifecenter.org slash give. And who has been enjoying our 21 days of prayer? I know for myself, my husband, and our household, we have been amazed at the way God has just been speaking. I mean, he's always speaking, but when there's fasting and prayer and this intentionality of our practices kind of rooted as, as a central focus, we give God new space to move. We give God new space to speak. And when we give him that space to speak, he always does. So I hope you've been engaging in our 21 days of prayer and fasting following along with the daily prompts. You would have gotten an email this morning if you're on our mailing list to print them all out and continue with us. And today actually marks the day, um, our first day of our third week. So we've got one week stretch left. If you haven't been engaged in prayer and fasting, 
start today. Why not have a one week fast? Or by all means, you can extend it for as long as you feel um, the Lord prompting you. So we encourage you to engage in our time of prayer and fasting. As well, a great way to uh, just really dig into that time is to tune in on our social media. If you're active on social media, our team are live on Facebook and Instagram every weekday morning at 9 a.m. And here's the thing. If you don't have Facebook or Instagram, for Facebook, you can still watch these videos. This is a helpful point because I've seen a couple messages online. You don't need Facebook to actually view the lives. You can just visit our Life Center page, um, even without an account, and you'll be able to watch the videos there. So we encourage you to do that. We'll see you online for tomorrow morning. As well, in this time of online and figuring things out in a new way, um, we have gifted Life Center and even the Friends of Life Center access to Right Now Media. And what that is, you can think of it as almost like a Netflix for biblical teaching, resources. They have full conference recordings on there and over 22,000 Bible studies recordings, even like Veggie Tales for the kiddos. I know I grew up on that. And so we encourage you to check that out. You can visit our website and you can log in through your Life Center access that way or create account. And feel free to share that. We want to share that. If you know a friend that could benefit with just some Bible teaching, feel free to point them to our website and they are more than welcome to hop on as well. Last thing is in this time of social distance and technology and all the things, um, we want to invite you to consider our newest round of Alpha happening on February 1st. And if you're not familiar with Alpha, we've shared about it a little bit the past couple weeks, but we've been sharing about it because we so believe in Alpha. We so believe in the power of community and even just providing a space for people to ask questions, the big questions about faith and life and all those, you know, all those big questions that you really need a safe place to talk about them about. So we want to encourage you, if you have a friend that's exploring faith or has questions, invite them to join in Alpha Online. We're doing it all through Zoom, so all that would look like is you register, your friend can register, and you guys can meet together in the Zoom. We have a couple groups going, so I encourage you to check out the groups on our website, lifecenter.org slash groups or slash alpha, either or, and you can find the group that works best for you. And before we invite Pastor Jason up for the word, continue in our series, Lord, Make Us One, that is our prayer. We're just going to take a moment to watch a video to learn a little bit more about alpha. We share things every day, things that are meaningful to us, that entertain, inspire, or challenge us. We share moments, good or bad, big or small, because what we share matters. We have the chance to share something incredible, the hope that has transformed our lives. And today, more than ever, people are searching for hope, for connection, for meaning. The life we've experienced in Jesus is available to our friends and neighbors and it's easier to share than we might think. Over the next few weeks, we are running Alpha, an opportunity to share Jesus with friends, family, and colleagues in person or online. Each week, we'll connect with each other, watch a short video, and have time to discuss our thoughts and questions without needing to have all the answers. All it takes is a simple invitation. Share life, faith, hope, Jesus. Who will you invite? Well, that's a fantastic question. <clears throat> Who will you invite? And so just prayerfully consider that. We're asking you to do it. And as Pastor Soraya said just a moment ago, we have one week left in our corporate church fast. And so keep going. We are in an intense season of strong pulls. Pulls on the outside. Pulls that are on the outside that affect how we think, that affect how we feel. I'm not sure about you, but for me, I find this new stay-at-home order, I had to take a really deep breath. I find it difficult. I don't, I, I don't enjoy speaking this morning to an empty room. We don't enjoy speaking to empty campuses. The church is us gathered together, yet we know why we have to do this. But there are pulls in all of these things. There are pulls in our hearts and lives. We're living in a season of really strong pulls. 
as the church, we have to look oftentimes at maybe our side, which is the charismatic side, and where prophecy has been unchecked and different things have been unchecked. We can see that there's some unhealth on one side of the church. On the other side, we can also see that there's a weight that a whole generation of us now are bearing, and I should say multi-generations on another side, where the gospel is really getting in, in, once again interwoven with works that if I don't say everything the right way, do everything the right way, if I don't see everything your way, then there's canceling, then there's out rage and there's all of these things. I'm not talking about the issues of injustice underneath those things. It's just sometimes the things on top of it where the gospel is getting woven in once again with works and that becomes a heavy load. We are in a season of strong pulls, not even in the culture, just even within the church, but the culture has tremendous pulls as well going on. And our hearts, my heart, yours, often pull in the direction desired, not always the directed direction intended. You know, Jesus said it more eloquently when he said this, do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, for where your heart is, for where what you value is, there, that's where you're going to find your heart. Where you, your values are, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is going to reside. And my heart, just like your heart, doesn't always reside where I desire it to be. My heart resides not where I had an intention of being. It, it's pulled by various things. And to best identify the pull, not only in the church and not only in culture, but to best identify the pull that affects our hearts and lives, we need to look at two places today. We need to look at our affections and we need to look at our afflictions. We're going to look at a story in the Old Testament and we're going to look at a story in the New Testament. Because in the Old Testament, there's a man named Samson. He's called by God and he's gifted by God with unbelievable strength. For Samson, he was so strong that he believed that he didn't need anyone else. And if you read the story of Samson in Judges chapter 16 and 15 and 17, you'll see that over and over and over again, he does everything himself. And like Samson, each one of us today, we have things in our lives where we're strong. But every single strength comes with a unique shadow. Somewhere in our hearts where we need somebody else, of course, we need the fullness of the Spirit of God. So sometimes in our lives, where we don't have understanding around our shadows, where in our lives we don't have healthy accountability, our strengths are there, but our shadows are where our heart can begin to drift. Our affections can begin to pull us in a different direction. You know, Samson, he mistakenly believes one thing. He believes that he is the source of his true strength, not God. He believes it's in him and not a God-given gift in his life. While once again, Samson, yeah, is unbelievably strong. This is true. He is also incredibly exposed as he has no genuine relationships that we can read of in Scripture, no real accountability in his life, no one to share a blind spot or a concern, no one to look and, and honestly speak truth into his life to be able to say, I think something is off here. And the Bible does a beautiful job once again in, Je in Judges 15 and 16, just showing us these little steps, these little vows that Samson breaks and seemingly God doesn't correct and seemingly nobody knows, but you're seeing his character begin to drift. You're seeing his heart begin to drift. You see in Samson that whatever he desires, he pursues. Whatever the affection of his heart is, if I feel it, how can it be wrong? If it's in me and it's what I feel so strongly, then how can it be wrong? And he simply pursues it, whether it is eating out of a carcass, which was a no-no, or in other ways, which we're now about to see. Samson was a Nazarite, which meant that there were specific things that he, unlike others, couldn't do. And a pattern we see in his life is consistent unfaithfulness to his vow. And whenever he had an affection, as I said just a moment ago, he pursues it without accountability. And one day, 
After living this way for a while, we enter his story in Judges chapter 16. There is always a season between what we do and when we're caught or when we confess or when we're caught in what it is that we've done. And I believe that part of the move of the Holy Spirit that we're in is we're in a season of revealing. It's always easy to see something in someone else. It's hard for someone maybe, it's hard to see our own shadows. And it's hard sometimes for us to hear when others speak these things. So Judges chapter 16 verse 1 says this. Samson went to Gaza and there he saw a prostitute and he went into her. This is Judges 16 verse 1. Continuing to read in verses 4 to 5. And after this it says he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, seduce him and see where his great strength lies. So Samson loves her. He First he pursues her. He sleeps with her. He falls in love. So the affection of his heart is pulled and he has no accountability and now he's vulnerable. His faith is rooted in his own strength, his own gift, his own abilities, and he doesn't yet know it. Seduce him and see where his great strength lies and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to humble him. And we will each give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Delilah in Hebrew means night. Samson's name in Hebrew is connected with the sun. And so in a poetic sense, the Hebrew writers want us to begin to engage here that the sun has fallen in love with the night. That there is something occurring here that shouldn't be occurring, that is ominous, that is dark, that is foreshadowing what is about to come. Samson is blind. He's not yet physically blind. That comes in a few minutes, in a few chapters in the story. But he is blind to where his affections have led him. Again, he's not blind in the sense that he can't see the danger. But he's blind in that he mistakenly believes he is stronger than he really is. How many of us have got ourselves in a difficult situation, in a situation of fallenness and brokenness? Because we have allowed the affections of our heart to delude us, not only to what it is that we chase, but we are in a space where we are deluded in thinking, in this space I am stronger than I actually am, that I can do this and it won't affect me. I can engage this, but it won't lead to bondage. I can watch this or I can speak this or I can share this or I can live this way. And like Samson, again, he has these little breaks of his vows, breaks of his vows, breaks of his vows. And because he's not corrected, because God doesn't come down like a heavy, he mistakenly believes that because God doesn't do that, God is okay with things. And there are some times in our lives where we can mistakenly believe in our lives that because maybe I can sing great worship songs or I know God, I have a lot of knowledge about God, that, that God is seemingly indifferent to these small things, but he isn't because affections create alignment issues in our hearts and lives. Straying from God happens one step at a time. Rarely does it happen in a single step. It does for some, but it's very, very, very minute who that happens to. Yet straying from God happens one step at a time. Samson plays with Delilah three times, not realizing that he is the one being played once again. He is blind in this situation, his shadow, his affection has led him to a place of blindness where he can't see. And sadly for Samson, once again, he has no one to speak into his life, to warn him, to say, this is what we can see going on in your life. It doesn't mean he would have heeded it, but at least it would have been another warning. For us as followers of Jesus, it's not about me, myself, and God. It is about, yeah, sure, there's a personal part to following Jesus. But we need others in our lives to speak not only words of affirmation and exhortation, but we also need others in our lives to speak words of love, which are words of truth. And Samson doesn't have this individual in his life. And here's what it says in Judges 16, verse 17. And he told her, he told Delilah, all his heart, and said to her, 
A razor has never come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Now this is true. This is true that he was a Nazarite. This is true now that he has shared his whole heart. But again, it wasn't his hair that was the source of his strength. That was the lightning rod moment or the touch point on earth. It was, it was the blessing of God. It was the strength of God. It was that Samson was called by God to be a deliverer. It was God moving on his behalf. It was God moving in his life. The hair was just a representation of it. Yes, it was part of his vow and a very important part. And I'm not, I'm not trying to demean that in any which way. And there is significance to this. But part of the story of Samson that we can see is the affections of his heart that he continues to chase again and again and again is really the symptom is pride. The root, I should say, is pride that is being surfaced in his life that once again he believes that everything in his life is as a result of his strength, his ability, all of these things disregarding who God is. Judges 16 verse 17 that we read just a moment ago breaks my heart. Because it's one of the first times we see in the story of Samson that he's truly vulnerable. That he truly exposes all of his heart, the secrets of his heart. But because he doesn't have anyone who's healthy in his life, that the first time that he's genuinely vulnerable, he exposes his heart to the wrong person. Church, it's not just that you and I talk about our shadows and talk about our struggles and talk about where our affections are pulling us with anyone is that we need to, with wisdom, be able to find the right people who we can trust with the things that are really going on in our hearts and in our lives. Judges 16, verse 20 then says, And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep. And here's what he said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. And this is the most tragic line in the story. But he did not know That the Lord had left him. See what I said a moment ago. His hair is significant, yes. But it's not that he got a haircut. He didn't realize, he didn't know that the Lord had left him. You know, the Samson syndrome is alive and well today. Because for you and I, and I want to talk specifically to some amazing, amazing individuals today, but I want you to Hear me with both ears and your whole heart. When you gave your life to Christ, that wasn't the finish line. It was the starting line. It's not just that then you get to go to heaven. You get to be with God. No, 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 no. That's living a life that is too small. It is too self-focused. Because when you gave your life to Jesus, there's now a ocean of growth for you and I to become more like Jesus. Because the more we become like Jesus, the more you and I let the affections of our heart be pulled from the things of this world and realigned to who Christ is and to be more like Jesus, then the more we make a Jesus-sized difference in the world that we live in, the more we can make a Jesus-sized difference in our singleness, in our relationships, in our marriage, in our parenting, in, in, in any which way that you want any at work, whatever it happens to be, that you and I can be used by God in an extraordinary way. So how do we align when the affections of our heart may be pulling us in this season? Well, of course, you can pursue your relationship with God. But don't pursue your relationship with God only alone. With other followers of Jesus, engage your relationship with God. Cultivate friendships. Cultivate people in your life who can Speak truth to you, not only what you want to hear, but sometimes what you need to hear. Spoken in love, yes, but spoken in truth. And remember, you were created for more than salvation. You have spiritual gifts. You have a ministry of reconciliation. You have a God-ordained mission. You are a part of the body of Christ that we need you. We need every single member of the body of of Christ ministering and serving a lost and broken world. And so to align our affections, it requires genuine Christ-like accountability. Where are your affections drawing and leading you today? 
And where do you have someone who can speak not only to your strengths, but to your shadows? You know, affections, though, are only one side. The other side that we want to engage is let's talk about our afflictions. The New Testament story, Jesus has a cousin named John. And this is what Jesus says about him. Luke 7, verse 28, Jesus says, I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. That is a crazy compliment coming from Jesus. That is a massive compliment. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. And John the Baptist fulfills two important Old Testament prophecies concerning Jesus. As a child in the womb, John leaps at the presence of Jesus. And as a man, John sees Jesus not only as his cousin, but as his Messiah. When he says this, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And in the same breath, John in this moment when he sees Jesus, he ushers these prophetic words. Here's what he says. He says that Jesus, in order for Jesus to do what Jesus needs to do, Jesus has to increase and I have to decrease. But John didn't count on the decreasing that was about to come. And sometimes in this season of affliction that we're going to read that John experiences, it can be profound. Herod is a king and he is sleeping with his brother's wife. And John in his day speaks up for righteousness. He speaks up against what is occurring here. And he calls the king to repentance. John speaks truth to power. And just like it was today or then, power doesn't like it. And it goes as well as you think. To silence John, Herodias puts him in prison. And Herodias has a daughter who dances for the king, dances for Herod. And he is so moved by lust that he promises her half of his kingdom. But at the request of her mother, she denies that. And she asks for John the Baptist's head. She asks for John to be executed. And without trial, which is against the law. So this is injustice that John is experiencing. What's happening to him should not be happening to him. He is now in prison and he is awaiting execution. As I said a moment ago, experiencing profound affliction, John, who's the same one who said that I have to decrease so that Jesus might increase, now is experiencing a decrease that he didn't define for his heart and life. And day after day and week after week in isolation and alone, his heart begins to stir. Now remember, Jesus said, born among women, John is the greatest. John, when he was in Elizabeth's stomach as a, as a baby, when Mary approaches and, Jesus, and Mary's pregnant with Jesus, he leaps. When he sees Jesus, he doesn't just see a family member. He says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is John. John knows who Jesus is. Yet he goes through a season of deep affliction. And his heart begins to be pulled Because here's what he says in prison in Matthew 11, verses 2 to 3. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, about Jesus, he sent word by his disciples, by John's disciples. People were following John. So he sends them to Jesus. And said to him, Are you the one who is to come? Or shall we look for another? Did you get that? John, the greatest born among women, John, who from his infancy knows who Jesus is. John, who knows that he has to decrease for Jesus to increase. John, who says, there's the Lamb of God who's going to take away the sin of the world. Pinpoint clarity on who Jesus is. But in a season of affliction, in a season where things begin to push upon him, not affection, affliction, John in this season begins to doubt John, day after day, week after week, when Jesus isn't doing what John thinks Jesus should be doing, for him, his heart begins to stir. Because affliction can cause even the most devout to experience doubt. Affliction can cause even the most devout followers of Jesus 
to experience doubt. Experiencing doubt doesn't mean that you're not strong. Experiencing doubt means that your heart is being pulled by the afflictions of what it is that you're experiencing. It makes you human. Because life is unfair. When what God requires sometimes, when God says no to something, no, this is how you're to live, when how we want to live crosses purposes with how God's word says we're to live. In any which way in our hearts and lives, these are hard spaces of affliction. When you ask in earnestly God to zig, and it seems as though God zags, these are hard seasons when you do everything correct according to the word, that you root in Jesus. You root in and you do everything his word says. And at best, it seems like God goes silent. At best, it seems that you live with unanswered prayer when you experience a season of affliction. It affects and it pulls on our hearts because affliction can cause a destabilizing doubt to pull our hearts in a different direction. James chapter 1, verses 6 to 8 says, But lem, let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. They are, he's a double-minded man. They are a double-minded woman. They are unstable in all their ways. There is a vast difference, church, between doubting what God is doing or isn't doing and doubting who God is. There's a vast difference between these two things. Double-minded means that you and I are torn between God and this world. We are torn between who we know God to be based on his word, not just who we desire him to be. That We are torn between who God is and what we see, who God is, and what is happening when we are torn in this space. This scripture can also touch our affections as well when we're torn between what God's word says and just what we want to do. John, the greatest according to Jesus, has been imprisoned now for over a year. You know what that means? No weekly synagogue, no community. He has to send word to his disciples. They can't come visit him. No spiritual friendships, no gatherings, only hearing about what Jesus is doing, not experiencing it for himself. And through a pandemic and John in prison, they can't be more dissimilar. They do have some similarities to the season that we find ourselves in. No gatherings are hard. No corporate community, no gathering even in a life group. No even just affection, a hug, a high five, a five minute prayer at the end of a service to say you're not alone. We're, we're here. We're here digitally. We're here. We want to reach out. But sometimes I, like you, want to scream through the camera. I want to scream. I just want to, you know, I'm not even a hugger and I want to hug. I want to wrap my arms. This is a difficult season. The sting of isolation and loneliness is very real in this season. And affliction always does one thing. When the enemy gets a hold of affliction, he has one purpose. And it's starting to be seen in the life of John here. And it can be seen in ours. Affliction seeks to align our hearts in offense towards God. Because once we become offended, Proverbs says that we become like a walled, fortified city. And the enemy knows that there's nothing he can do to separate you from God, but you and I in our own decisions and our own afflictions can distance ourselves from him. Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you, but that doesn't mean that you and I can't begin to push away. One of the things Isaiah prophesied about Jesus, and let's not forget this one. He says, and he, Jesus, he will become a sanctuary, and that's beautiful. But Isaiah also said he'll become a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared 
and taken. I'm really not sure you can follow Jesus and not go through a dark night of the soul. A season where your faith is tested. Where a trial, where you try on a trial. Not because you want to, but because you have to. But the trial comes seemingly two to three sizes too big than where your faith exists in that season, in that moment. But John does something really wise that you and I must do in seasons of affliction. We read it just a second ago. He sent word to his disciples to go ask Jesus something. Oh, hear me with both ears and your whole heart. In a season of affliction, you're never wrong when you turn with your tough questions to Jesus. When you turn to Jesus and ask him the things that are on your heart. Just like the story of Samson, be careful where you turn in a season of affliction. Be careful to whom you turn, to where you're looking for wisdom, to where you're looking for guidance, to where you're looking for these things. Be careful. Jesus gets the question from John and here's what Jesus says. And Jesus answered them. He answers the disciples and here's what Jesus says. Go and tell John what you see and what you hear. And now Jesus begins to quote what the only the Messiah was going to do. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the good news preached to them. And then he says these words. To get all of that is, I am the Lamb of God is going to take away the sin of the world. Like we talked about last week, where this river flows, where this coal touches, life begins to flow, and we see this in the person of Jesus. And then he ends and says this part, and blessed is the one who is not offended at me. In other words, John, I am Christ. I'm not just your cousin. I am the Messiah. I am the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And I'm the same one who's not going to come and rescue you from prison. And now John has to rest. And here's the question. Do I trust God is who he says he is? Or does my doubt deconstruct my belief in Jesus? Do I trust God is who he said he is based in his word? Or does my doubt deconstruct my faith in who Jesus says he is? To align in our aff afflictions requires genuine courage to trust God is in spite of what I'm going through. Because here's what's true about outrage. An offense because we're living in a time of outrage. Some things are outrageous, and some things we just are addicted to outrage. A statement of offense or outrage doesn't speak to whether it is true or false, it just speaks to an emotion, a belief, a perspective, or a worldview. So the presence of outrage or offense doesn't always mean an offense has taken place. Jesus has done nothing to John at all. Herod, Herodias, yeah. Unjust trial, yeah. Jesus has done nothing to John. And so Jesus says, I am who I am. And John, you're going to have to trust in a grander vision of the Father that you can't see in this moment. You're going to have to trust God is working all things for good when it seems like nothing is good is happening. And John, in this place, here's the danger. Remember I said with Samson, he didn't have anyone to speak truth. Jesus speaks loving truth to John by saying, John, don't become offended. Don't become outraged with me. A season of affliction can cause even the greatest to wrestle with doubt. But Jesus is our better Samson. 
Because in Jesus, there is no shadow. And Jesus is our better John. Because when he was pressed and afflicted, Jesus said, not my will, Father, yours be done. Jesus is. The goal of this whole year of being more like Jesus, but also particular in these 21 days, Lord, make us one. Today, we're talking about making us one between the Father, but also one this way. The heart behind all of it once again is not that we become like Samson, nor do we become like John. It is that we become like Jesus. So one final question and then we pray. Is your heart being pulled by your affections? Or is your heart being pulled in a season of affliction? In order to have Christ-like alignment, we need others to speak truth to us in seasons of affection. But in seasons of affliction, we need God to speak truth. We need God's word to be true in the person of Jesus, to speak to our hearts. Because alignment isn't just to what I think, feel, or believe. Alignment is to who Christ is. Because in Christ, all things are still possible. Together, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we take a moment right now when we pray for each and every one of us in this season. Father, would you, call, Holy Spirit, speak to us about our affections, the things in our lives that want to pull our heart, hearts in different directions. Lord, help us cultivate friendships in our lives where we can not only exhort one another and be encouraged, but also have truth spoken to us. Father, may we not be like Samson and blind to our behaviors. May we not think that we can cozy up with the enemy and there'll be no consequence. Align our hearts, Lord. And Father, for those who are in affliction, I take authority over words spoken over them that just because they doubt what God is doing, that they're a bad Christian, that they're, they don't get it, that they're not spiritual enough. Lord, we recognize again the difference between wondering what you're doing and doubting who you are. And so, Father, I pray for those experiencing affliction, Lord, that you'd be close in this, pandem in this pandemic season that is long and that it's difficult. God, I pray and I speak encouragement to every heart and strength in every heart, God. And Jesus, for those who are offended at you because you didn't do seemingly what you said you could do, Jesus, Speak truth to them in such a loving way as only you can through your word. And Father, help remove the wall of offense between them and you. And in this place, Lord, may we be aligned, not to the kingdom of this world, but to the kingdom of heaven. And not to the stuff of society, but to the lover of our soul. In your name we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. May God bless you and may he keep you. Have an extraordinary Sunday. Thank you for inviting us into our homes. We're praying with you. We're here. If you need anything, we are here. All right. May God keep you and may he bless you in this season. Mm -hmm.